I'm going to take a moment and show you a little book that came with your machine. You may have actually taken it out of the box and set it aside and haven't taken a second look at it. And what it is, it is an accessory book. This is a great little book because Bernina has all sorts of sewing toys that you know we love we sewers love. And this book is going to go through and tell you all sorts of goodies that are available for you and that make your sewing experience much easier and much more pleasurable. Many of the equipment found in this book will be uh, reviewed and talked about in your classes, in the Bernina Clubs, and in your Mastering Your Bernina series. For a few minutes, I would like to talk about two other subjects in the sewing world. They really impact your sewing and they can either affect your day by making it a good day or a bad sewing day. And that is needles and thread. Quite frankly, <laughs> it's kind of a really boring topic. But the more you understand about these particular items, the better off you can solve some of the issues that you might end up having with your machine. So the first thing I want to talk about is needles. And the way I like to think of it is needles are broken down into really just three categories. There is a sharp needle, and that's like a really pointy, pointy pencil. If you take that pencil and blunt it down a little bit, you have what's called a universal. If you blunt it down even more, you have a ballpoint. And actually, there are some other uh, more blunted down ballpoints, but they're kind of specialty oriented. But if you think, remind yourself that there's really only three different types of needles in the main categories, then really you've kind of made your life a little bit easier. So years ago, they used to really only have two types of needles. They had sharps and they had ballpoints. And um, in fact, they used to draw ballpoints with this ball at the end of it. And I remember as a kid trying to find the ball. I'd look really close at it to try to find the ball at the end of the needle and I could never find it because it really wasn't there. <laughs> so they started to redraw this needle, not like this. Some of you might remember this, but they just draw it more as a really blunted needle. So somewhere along the line, and I don't know when this happened, they took a sharp needle and they took a ballpoint and they hybrided it and they made a universal. Now sharp needle is used with woven fabrics. That's a lot like the quilting fabrics that you might use. This jacket is a woven fabric. Most wools are going to be woven linen. And then we had ballpoints, which are for our knit fabrics. Of course, that comes in many different uh, fibers too and are very, very popular today. So they took the two and they hybrided it and on many of today's wovens and knits, we can use this universal needle. But we have also had some high-tech fabrics that are very, very tightly woven together and that's when we want to use um, the sharp needles and they actually have some other names for them. You might see the name Microtech Needle, which is the high, very, very high-tech fabrics. Um, think of a lot of fabrics that might be windproof. And actually, if you use Batik, which is very tightly woven, you might want to consider using these sharp needles. We also have some new modern knit fibers that are very soft and they're very drapey. And they're actually more likely to possibly even even skip stitches. So that's when you might want to go to your ballpoint needles. So I generally use ballpoint needles when I'm using high chemical fabrics or some of the really soft knits or expensive knits. Some of our knits we had a couple of years ago were a little bit firmer and they worked really well with the universals. But we do have this new category, it's not really a new category, but this lovely new kind of knit that's soft and drapey. We actually re uh, recommend a needle called a stretch needle. It has an elongated scarf in the back of it that helps to prevent skipping stitches. For average sewer, you are going to buy mostly universal needles. I do recommend that you put in your supply of needles 
a couple of the sharp needles, which I one of the things I neglected to mention was, yes, the lower sizes are called Microtech needles, but the higher size is called a denim needle. And so those will be located in the, and we'll talk about sizes here in just a moment, but they're located in the higher size. Think, you know, think denim. Microtech, think of a lighter, like windproof fabrics, and they're in the lower sizes. So these are all just marketing words to help you also find these needles better if you go into a store and you look on a wall and there's all these needles and you don't know what to choose. Those kind of words like a microtech, a microfiber, um, or denim are going to ring more true to you. You also might want to consider because these lighter weight knits have become so popular that if you tend to hem a knit or you know, to shorten it or even alter them, you might want to consider having some of the ball points, but you might want to consider these really special ball points that are our stretch ball points. Another needle that I strongly recommend that you keep in your sewing supplies is a top stitching needle. A top, what makes a top stitching needle unique is the fact that the eye of the top stitching is very large. So if I have a needle, an eye of a needle, on a regular needle, it's proportionately sized to the needle. As the needle gets a little bit bigger, the eye gets a little bit bigger. But if you're gonna use heavy threads, you're gonna want a needle that will take and carry the heavy threads. So you're gonna wanna make sure the eye is bigger you can't just go up a size. That's what we used to do years ago, which kind of sort of seemed like it didn't make any sense that if I'm using kind of a medium weight fabric and I want to put a heavier thread on it, that I'd have to go clear up to a big gigantic size needle. So instead, they have top stitching needles and I love top stitching needles. There are even some brands of thread that recommend that you use them. And if you still have to manually thread the eye of a needle, or as I say, for Aunt Bertha, who still sews and maybe can't see very well because she's sewing on that 1965, you know, straight stitch sewing machine, you might want to give her some top stitching needles because she'll be able to thread the eye a lot easier. And what they do is they just make a bigger eye in the needle. So instead of being this normal size eye, it's significantly larger. The other thing is that the scarf in the front of the needle is also deeper so it can handle that larger thread going through it. So I have a big gigantic needle right here and in the front of a needle there is actually a groove down the front of the needle and that groove is where the thread is going to hide. I've got some foil on this thread. That's where the thread is going to hide when that needle goes through your fabric. So if we didn't have this groove in the front of the needle, the thread would stick out. And as this needle goes through the fabric, this thread would rub on the fabric and it would the friction would actually cause the thread to break. That's what happens if you turn insert your needle backwards. Usually your thread just breaks left and right. And that's because there's no place for the thread to hide. Now on our modern sewing machines, they're actually designed so that if you put the needle in backwards, it'll actually rotate to the front. Older machines may not, um, weren't really designed like that. There's also a flat on the back of the needle and we always say the flat goes to the back. But like I said, on your modern machine, it is designed so that the flat will rotate to the back. I very rarely have ever seen a customer with their needle in backwards on a Bernina sewing machine. The next thing we want to think about is we want to use the correct size of needle. And the reality of it is there's a whole entire range of sizes. So when we look at the sizes of a needle, there are two numbers usually written on the package. You're going to see a number that's like 70, 80, 90, and that is a true micrometer reading. So it's a true measurement. The other number, 10, 12, 14, is an arbitrary number. Sometimes we refer to the 10, 12, 14 as the American or uh, the um, Japanese number, um, and the 80 is usually the European number. 
Most needles nowadays are multi-marked. And years ago, most people used to only speak the language, the American language. And now more and more people um, are using um, the European number because it is a true micrometer reading. Of the whole line of needles, there are gonna be needles that you're gonna never ever use and don't really ever have to worry about. If you tend to sew really lightweight fabrics and use a lighter thread, like an heirloom sewer, or sew a lot of chiffon, you might use a size 60, but for most people, you'll never be sewing fabric that light. For the average person, you're gonna use 70s, 80s, and 90s. Our size 70 is what I refer to as a blouse weight cotton. 80 is what I call bottom weight. And when I mean bottom weight, I mean like light um, cotton sheeting, chino kind of weight, um, a weight that would make uh, a dress that would be not a dress that's flowy or drapey, but a dress that would have form to it. 90 is what I call suit weight. 100, 110, 120 starts getting into your heavier upholstery type fabrics. And instead of using these larger needles, I usually opt to use that really pointy Dunham needle instead. You should try to use a needle that's close to the weight of the fabric you're working with. In other words, if I have a really, really lightweight fabric like a chiffon, I'm not gonna use a size 90 in it. I'm gonna use a, set, a 60 or a 70. If I'm sewing with a wool, I might use a 70, 80, excuse me, an 80, 90, or a size 100. So you can cross sizes a little bit, but for most people, your box, your sewing box should have plenty of 70s, 80s, and 90s. If you are a home decorator, you're gonna to wanna to have some of these larger sizes. You're also gonna find, you might run into what I call some cross sizes. And there's 65, which is like a midway between, and a 75, once again, midway between a 70 and 80. As a general rule of thumb, I basically tell you to forget about them. Because to me, those needles are designed to pacify novice sewers who are intimidated by all these needle sizes and don't know what to do with them. So it's just easier to tell them, well, here's a uh, size 75 and a 90. And so, you know, that'll work for a while for the average person. So if you were in a desert island and were only allowed to have two needle sizes, that would be fine. But <laughs> most of us are not on a desert island, so we're not gonna worry about that. So don't worry about that size of a needle. Sometimes in some multi-packages of quilting needles, you may find they may have a 75 and a 90 in it, and that's perfectly fine. One of the other things that you wanna consider about a needle is they do not last forever. Often, if you have a stitching problem on your machine, we're going to ask you, when was the last time you changed your needle? And Bernina will always say that for a consumer to solve a problem, you need to consider three things. You need to, if they call it TNT, thread, needle, tension. Thread, needle, tension, thread, needle, tension, thread, needle, tension. It's gonna sound like a broken record because you can actually solve many of your own sewing problems by addressing thread, needle, and tension. So the average needle only lasts 40 minutes of sewing time. It's kind of hard to believe, but a needle will last 40,000 needle penetrations. If your machine runs a thousand stitches a minute, then if you do the math, it's 40 minutes of sewing time. But most of us do not sit with the pedal to the metal and sew nonstop for 40 minutes. We sew on and off, on and off, on and off, and we vary our speed. And most of the time we're sewing more like 500 stitches a minute. So one needle is perfectly ample for going, for doing um, a particular project. If you hit a zipper tab or obviously your presser foot or, and possibly could burr a needle or a pin, you're gonna to wanna to change that needle. And that is one of the reasons why we tell you that you shouldn't run over pins. Running over, over pins is actually a form of, well, we all do it, quite frankly, 
But if you strike a needle onto a pin, you're not only going to bend your pin, but you could damage your needle. In that case, throw both of them away. At any time, if you should ever have a question about what needle you should purchase, don't ever hesitate to ask myself or any of the staff members, and we would be happy to guide you to the proper and correct needle for your project. And my last suggestion to you is, Needles are not like milk and bread. They don't go bad. So when you can and we have a needle sale or when you get an opportunity, stock up on needles so that in the middle of the night, <laughs> on a Saturday night or Sunday night, in the middle of a project, if you break a needle, you won't, you know, you'll have something that you can grab and sew with. So my suggestion is to always have an ample supply of needles in your arsenal because they will last you a long time um, and they like I said they're not going to rot in your box. The next thing I want to talk about is thread. Thread probably plays a bigger role in your sewing than your needles do and the biggest thing I can tell you about thread is quality, quality, quality and one of the great advantages of sewing in the year 2000 uh, and 20 is the fact that um, the industry has really answered the call for better thread and we have better thread today than we've ever had. The lecture we used to give 25 to 30 years ago was a lot about what to avoid because there was so much bad thread on the market. We can all thank quilters for bringing better quality thread to the market because quilters and the industry listen to the quilters' needs and, pro and have provided some really, really nice high quality threads. One of the reasons why we want to use high quality thread is it has to do sometimes with the length of the fiber used in the thread itself. In the lower quality threads, often these little tiny fibers spun together are the things that are going to actually catch on the fabric and cause puckering. So believe it or not, puckering is not really caused by your machine, it's caused by your thread. The only way your machine can really pucker your fabric is if you, if you turn your tension from a normal setting up to 10 or a higher number, that will cause puckering. Maybe if your needle is burred or doesn't have a, or broke a tip on it. But for the most part, puckering can be solved by simply changing your thread to a better quality brand. All these little fibers in that thread are going to catch on the fabric as the thread goes through the fabric. Now, if you take a really good look at thread, and actually, if you go on the internet and look at some microscopic pictures of thread, you're gonna find that some brands of thread are very hairy. Some brands of thread are very, very smooth. And, and threads have different types of purposes too. You have to remember that. But there used to be a brand of thread that in their advertising showed a small little bear holding a spool of thread. And the headline to it was, some things were meant to be fuzzy and other things were not. And I always looked at that and thought, what are they talking about? They had the fuzziest thread on the market, so I don't know if they were talking about the bear or the thread. But that thread is not very popular and is very difficult to find nowadays because they people just started not to use it because my mother always told me, don't use this brand of thread because it's really bad and um, I followed her advice and didn't use it. One of the reasons why a very, very hairy thread will cause puckering is because when a machine makes a stitch and the needle goes through the fabric and it delivers the thread to create the stitch, a single point of thread will actually go in and out of the eye of the needle uh, 40 to 60 times depending upon the length of the stitch. So that means that this thread, if it's really hairy, is going in and out of the eye of the needle very, very fast, and it's actually causing it to get more and more hairy. And these little hairs are gonna catch on the fabric and it's gonna cause the fabric to pucker. 
There are three basically different types of thread. There is cotton, polyester, and rayon, and each has its purpose in the sewing world. The first thread is cotton, and cotton is much recommended for quilters. And there's a more of a preservation aspect to using cotton. And the reason why is because think of it this way, cotton grows on a plant, and those little fibers are relatively short. And so they take those little fibers and they comb them out and they spin them together. And those fibers are, you know, they're only as big as a cotton ball. So, um, so the fiber in a cotton thread tends to be short and it tends to break very, very easily. This just happens to be a little bit thicker cotton thread, but it tends to break very easily. And the point of it breaking has to do when you quilt, and cotton thread is more popular with quilters, is that over the course of the longevity of a quilt, which could be a hundred or more years, if the seam in the quilt should break, the cotton thread will break instead of being so strong that it'll actually cut and rip the fabric. So the cotton thread has a weakness to it that is actually highly desirable. But if you make a garment out of cotton thread and you're on the dance floor at a wedding and you bend over backwards, you could rip the seam out of your pants. We've all seen videos of the guys ripping out of the back of their pants. But if you realize you haven't seen too many of those videos in the last 10 or 15 years or so, we all have known a guy who has done that. And that's because I think the industry, the garment industry, is going more to better polyester type threads. And we'll get to those in just a minute. So one of the features of cotton thread is that it's weak enough to break, which can be of great benefit, but it doesn't lend itself very well for garment construction. So it's still the thread, it can be still the thread of choice in the quilting world. Uh, because then this way, if your seam should pop in the quilt, it can be easier to repair the pop than it is if the fabric gets ripped by using a different type of fiber. The other thing to remember about cotton is, even though we have cotton thread, this is a cotton quilting thread, there's actually cotton hand thread. And there's also different other weights of cotton thread that we actually use for decorative sewing. Cotton as a fiber is not a super shiny fiber. It can be polished up a little bit to have a little bit of a sheen. And in that case, those threads we use for decorative sewing. It's a natural fiber. It has a voluptuous puffiness to it. It has a lovely sheen on it. It flexes well through the stitching. And so it can be very, very lovely for doing decorative type sh uh, stitching, but it can be very, very difficult to find. The next type of thread that is very popular in the sewing world is our polyester thread. And the advantage of polyester thread is that it is very strong. Our standard all-purpose sewing thread is actually has one other feature in it that makes it highly desirable. And that is, is that, and it's real hard for you to see this, but it has stretch in it. So if you sew a garment together with it and you bend over, it's going to stretch a little bit so you won't pop out of your seam. This is one of the reasons why we don't see that notorious film of the guy dancing on the dance floor and ripping out the back of his pants. So for regular all-purpose sewing, you should use all-purpose polyester sewing thread. And now today, we don't have as many blendings like cotton wrap polyester. Most companies, including Dual Duty, have 100% polyester thread and they can extrude the polyester into a very, very long fiber and make it very smooth. So that's why our, when our, even our sewing threads have gotten better and better. Our favorite brand, by the way, happens to be the Mettler brand sewing thread. There is also another type of polyester. It's sometimes referred to as tri-lobal polyester. I don't really know what that means, 
but I think it's just highly extruded. And its advantage is that it's a very, very long fiber. They polish it up. It has a shine to it. It's very, very strong. It's very, very strong. But it doesn't have a ton of stretch in it, and it is actually perfect for automatic machine embroidery. So if you have an embroidery machine and module, this is the type of thread you're going to use for your embroidery. It is also designed at what we call a 40 weight, and a 40 weight is, is perfect for digitized designs because they've been designed to work with this thread. So our polyester thread is a different type of weight and it doesn't, it's not impressive to sew with for embroidery. So we don't use this thread. It's flat, it has no sheen to it, and it's for a normal seam. Instead, we purchase a thread designed very specifically to use with embroidery. As a matter of fact, this thread I use only for embroidery. I don't use it for any kind of other types of sewing because it doesn't have that, that stretch in it that um, is very, very uh, beneficial. Another type of thread is our rayon thread. And rayon thread is strictly for decorative type sewing. Its basic feature is that it is very, very shiny. Rayon is wood, um, is a processed wood pulp. So it's actually a natural man-made processed uh, fiber. So it's a combination of both. But it's very, very shiny. It's very, very flexible, but it doesn't have any strength whatsoever. So it breaks very, very, very easily. In fact, Many people will complain that this thread really breaks very easily when they sew with it. But it's absolutely beautiful for decorative type stitching. Because it's a natural fiber, it also has um, a voluptuousness to it, um, a, a little bit of a thread body to it, much like a cotton thread does. So this is perfect for decorative stitching, but not great. Don't sew a seam with it because your seam will pop. So if we talk a little bit about thread weight, you're gonna find that cotton threads come in several different types of weight, and so does the, the rayon thread. Most rayon thread is either going to be a 30 weight or a 40 weight, and 40 is the most common weight that you will find. It's the most common size if you do embroidery on an embroidery machine, you can use this, and um, there's also a 30 weight that's a thicker, heavier thread. It's much more difficult to find. And in this sulky branded thread, it actually has red writing on the spool. But the 30 weight is the most common one that you're going to find at the big box stores. Most private stores do not sell sulky thread because it can be found at our bigger box stores that we all go to, which is Joann's. Our cotton thread, though, comes in multiple different weights. And one of the trends right now is to sew quilting with much, much finer thread. It doesn't take as much space up in your seam allowance and will can give you greater sense of accuracy. Another trend is to also use these high-tech polyester threads in quilting because a lot of quilts are very highly stitched as far as lots of pieces coming together and there's a lot of quilting on top of it. The more you quilt on top of a quilt the less likely it's going to be it's going to fall apart. So there is a high acceptance on these high-tech polyester threads because they're so thin. To understand weights of thread which you'll often find with cotton is it has to do with the amount of meters of thread that weigh a gram. So if you have a 50 weight thread versus a 30 weight thread, that means that 50 meters of thread weighed a gram versus 30 meters of thread. And 30 is less thread, so that thread's gotta be heavier. And it is, it's going to be a little bit heavier. So when we choose our cotton threads, sometimes we choose them by weight because those weights will dictate what we do with them.
we actually have a Bernina club called Doodling with Decorative Stitches. And in that class, we spend the first part of the class experimenting and playing around with all sorts of different weights of threads to see what these threads look like when we put them into the decorative mode. We also talk about what all these threads um, that you might use them for um, and what they're most desirable for. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about threads, that's a really great class to attend. So my last note on needles and threads are to seek out private stores because the staff there tends to know the products that have been chosen to carry in the store, what they're good for, and are more than happy to help you and pick out the right type of threads. At our store, if you come up to our counter and you have one of our threads that I'm not so sure it's what you want, I'm going to ask you. I always say I'm going to interrogate you because chances are you may have grabbed our, our 50 weight cotton thread when you, what you really needed was the polyester thread or vice versa. So we're here to help you get the right thread for the right project. And also, my suggestion for choosing private stores is we want to sell the best thread. And because we don't, <laughs> we don't want to hear from you. We don't want to have you have problems with your machine because of the thread that you purchase, a poor quality thread. So my suggestion to you is if you have a lot of really old thread that dates back to the 70s or the 80s, just throw it away. It probably is dust covered, dirty, it might even be smelly. Is it rotted? No. Thread will last, they have carbon dated thread that's really old. It can last a very long time, but do you really want to sew with really old thread? Personally, I don't. The other suggestion I have for you is do not store your thread on those racks that have the pegs on it that you hang in your sewing room. Those were very, very popular up to about maybe 1995. After that, my suggestion is um, that you store your thread, um, I should say is after that, uh, more storage boxes became available. Because if you store your thread on those thread racks, they tend to get really dusty and if you have a sunny room, you're going to get fading on the thread. So usually a spool of thread on a thread rack could sit for years before you use it again. You should really put your thread in a drawer or in a box and put it in the closet. And because many sewers today are sewing with a wide variety of different types of threads, you will want to segregate the different types of threads away from each other. So if you have embroidery thread, you're gonna to wanna to let it live in its own boxes. And that's gonna be the same uh, with your cotton threads and your polyester threads. One of the things that Bernina has produced is this thing called the Big Book of Feet. Now this book um, is, was actually produced in the United States and Switzerland saw it and thought it was such a really, really great production that they took it and um, put their, um, you might want to see their, their fingerprints on it. And it is a really, really neat book that uh, goes through all the different feet that Bernina has available, how to use them. It cross-references uh, to different types of feet that can do the same job. And it is a just a fabulous resource of the different types of feet that are available. So if you should also maybe have purchased a foot and then don't use it for a year or two, you can actually refer to the book and say, oh yeah, that's how that foot works. If you have an embroidery module, Bernina has also produced the big book of embroidery. It has everything, all the hoops, all the accessories, um, it is also a really, really nice reference um, book for your machine. In fact, I would even go to say that with the combination of these two books, you might actually use these two books more frequently than you might even look at your owner's manual. So we have reached the conclusion of Masters 1A. 
And when you come to the live part of Masters 1B, we're going to give you a, your spool of thread. We're going to go over winding a bobbin and threading your machine. We hope that you have practiced that because you should have gotten a demonstration of that when you picked your machine up. You should have sat down at a machine and threaded the machine. And hopefully you're also, you have also been sewing with your machine. So when you come, we're going to give you a spool of thread. We'll get you all set up for a sewing process. We're going to spend a little bit of time going through some of the uh, functions and features that are directly located on the machine, and then we'll start sewing. So if you have any kind of questions concerning what you learned in this video, don't hesitate to ask in the beginning of the class, even if um, it is to review anything about needles, threads, or cleaning your machine. And with that, we will see you in the live class. But before you do that, you're going to need to uh, write down what the secret phrase is. And this way, we'll know that you watched this video. And the secret phrase is Laura, Jodell, Sharon, and Carol all teach the Master Series and the Bernina Clubs. That's it. We'll see you in class.